Nifa, I know you have done these interviews in Chinese, but we would like to hear uh, your story uh, uh, told by you uh, in English. Sure. So maybe you can tell us uh, maybe uh, some of the important moments of your life, uh, what make you what who you are now, uh, or maybe some stories from your childhood, from your parents' background that make you so sensitive to uh, social issues and to commit yourself uh, in this particular way. See, si. thank you. Thank you for asking. I think it will be, that's a big question. It will be a long story, but I'll make it short. Um, many people have asked me what made you who you are today. Is it the influence from the education abroad? Or is it because your parents, they give you certain influential um, environmental cultivation? Or why are you doing things that you're doing now? But to make it real simple, my parents, both my mom and my dad, they are farmers. They didn't really have years of education. My mom is illiterate. My dad, I think he only had about three or four years of education. So during the Japanese uh, occupied Taiwan era, he doesn't really have that much of so-called uh, education. However, they were very simple people and they are hardworking. So when I grew up in rural Taiwan, in central Taiwan, in Yunnan County, both of my parents, they were, you know, they, they have rice in the field, they grow, they have pigs on a the farm, they have a pond to raise fish. And I remember I was just running around wild rules and have fun. And I, I pretty much like a little uh, uh, girl who doesn't really play with girls. I usually play with my brothers, so climbing trees, go um, talk to fish and catch frog and doing all kinds of fun things. So I was very little, very little, um, I was very, very much treated like, as long as you do your work, you're free. So I did. And I'm always very curious. I remember when I was very little, maybe four or five years old, during the Chinese New Year, you know all the, all the, the traditional family, they would put uh, Chun Nian. So you have this, uh, um, for the New Year, you paste this red paper written, the poems for blessing a good year and that. And of course, all my brothers and sisters, they all been in school, they know how to read. But I, I was a younger, I don't know. So I, I look at that. And my father only allowed sons to help to paste these red papers on the door. So the girl is supposed to just watch. So I watch. And I keep asking, what does that mean? And they will explain to me. And, and then pretty soon, after you know, watching that, I learned, I self-taught how to read. At that time, we don't have any like illustrated storybooks or any newspaper or magazine. It's not available in rural Taiwan. And so, six years old or seven years old, um, I remember our neighbors, they were, they were asking if someone know how to read this. They want to know the right from the left, which one to go first. Because I had seen so many times my parents did that. And all my brothers and my father did that. So I said, well, I, I know. You put that one on the right and put this one on the left. And that one on the across on the top. Then the, the neighbor asked me, the uncle asked me, do you know what does that mean? Oh, I, I think I know. That one is this and that. So I read out loud what, because some of them were repeated, so the characters I recognized. That was the very first time I got praise for my uh, so-called being smart at that time. Never been to school, but I can read. I can read. And then I eager to learn. Always. I don't know that's just part of DNA or what. But when my brother and sister they want to go to school and I, I watch them, they get a school bag and they, they were walking or getting on their bicycle to go to school. I always got up the same time as they did and waited for my turn to also go to school, but it will be years later. And that 
is something I remember very clearly. And once I was in school, I remember, I, for some reason, I just uh, a bit more outspoken and more mature than the other children, I think, because at home, I was allowed to do a lot of things and make decisions. And so our family was the first one to have television in the village. So that many people were gathered at 6 o'clock p.m. on that on time, everybody sit and watching TV. So I had pretty much learned uh, how to behave because the grandmother would say, you need to yield the seat for the elders and all that. Even uh, some little you know, uh, sort of subtle things that we have to pay attention to make sure the villagers were happy. And that's how I really think I've been cultivated for storytelling. Because people get together and we watch TV, people talk. And for the festival too, the temple festival, uh, people will get together and, and, and then you watch a, a, a puppetry or you watch some kind of uh, Chinese opera. And, and I remember my parents and some of the workers work in the field. They all have a little radio, the pocket size and then listen to this broadcast uh, story. And it's like one chapter a day. So every day you have a different uh, advancement for the story. That is where my listening, tentative listening. So you listen to the story and I, I got to also watch how other people interact. And, and I think that's how come I myself become not so t timid. I can talk in the property because I been seeing people all the time. And then, ever since I was in elementary school, I always was selected as the class leader, all the way up to college. And once upon a time, I remember, I was the second year in junior high, it was in junior high school. So it was seventh, eighth grade. My father, um, he didn't do very good in business because later on he invested money, he lost all the land and, and we have to move to relocate it to Taipei. And he suggested that I should just go to work. Don't go to school because the family needs money. So I went to a factory uh, and learned how to weave clothing. At that time I can make a lot of money. Uh, so for the summer vacation, I had learned something that my classmate never had a chance to because the family need help. So I, I said, sure. And that really helped me to see uh, the differences among if you don't go to school, you work like that. So I know I don't want to be like my parents, nor do I want to work that, that hard. But I'm willing to help my family out. So I went and uh, talked to my teacher. My father would not let me continue school. And uh, my teacher says, oh, that's too bad, but you are good at that. Why don't I come to your house and talk to your dad? I say, okay. So, and I remember when my teacher talked to my, my father about, uh, for me to continue school. He says, well, you know, right now we are very difficult financially. We don't really have money for her to go to school. If she's so capable of studying, then she should be solely responsible on her own. I won't be able to support financially. And I was thinking, oh. Then my teacher says, oh, it's okay. Um, Mr. Tang, if you don't have financial support for your daughter, I can support her. And when she graduates, after she makes money, then she can pay back to me. That was the second time in my life that I got really encouraged by, because my teacher and uh, told me that I am eligible to apply for scholarship. So I learned that I can get scholarship too. So I got ever since then, every semester, okay, all the way into college. And then I, I, told, I said to myself, I want to study and learn more someday because this is, apparently it's not enough. I want to see the world, I would like to travel and all that. So I start, start to do uh, traveling with my best friend by bus in Taiwan, well, 40 some years ago. And that was very rarely done by a little girl. Normally it's not, uh, but it's quite safe in Taiwan. So we didn't have any worry. But 
I know I'd like to see and learn. So then I proposed to um, my mom and my dad saying that I would like to go to America to study someday. They heard America, they think you dreamer. How can you? Because at that time, one US dollar is 45 Taiwan dollars. That's a big difference there. But I thought, why not? I think I can find a job and all that. So every goal at different time of my life, I set a goal to do something. It seems just to be the right thing to do. And I just got a visa when everybody says it's impossible to get, I got it the first time. When everybody says it's impossible for you to get scholarship in America or get a job, I got a scholarship and I got a job. So I went to America and studied. And I remember before I got married with my husband, I told him that someday when I uh, graduate, I would like to come back to Taiwan just to give a feedback to my country. The, a place that raised me and cultivate uh, me to grow up. And of course, when I was young, I had to help parents because they have some difficult years. I think that is also a very important nutrients for me to be able to be uh, such a close uh, observer. I can see things that a lot of people don't see because uh, when you have to make a living by knowing when to say things or when not to say things or uh, how to behave so that you can get out of trouble, something like that. So when I was in America, I also realized how precious the opportunity that I have. And I, I don't even know much of English, but then I, I decided I should choose either education or something in medicine. And because I didn't really have that background in education nor in medicine, I was in business in Taiwan as a major. I decided I'll just try it out and see what happened. So the first class, I um, no, before I went to the class, we should do a test to know where I should go and all that. I only got two points out of 100 for my English. But the rest of them, my score was so fine that they told me that I can jump, you know. Um, but because I'm a foreigner, therefore I don't really need to worry about English because it's a second language then. So then I was qualified to get into the program. And then my very first course is biology. The vocabulary was so huge, but I found it so amazingly interesting because everything I learned and heard about was all about our human body. It was all about things I never knew before. I was like a sponge. I started to learn all this big vocabulary and I I took notes in Chinese, but I, I just did all that. And I finished the school. And I have to say, America, it is a truly a very important part of how I see the world now. Because in the school, unlike Taiwan, you have very monoculture-like people to go to school with. But in America, the campus is filled with so many multicultural, uh, talented people. And so I was in Wisconsin, and um, I just love that people are so friendly and, and humble, down to earth. It's just like the agricultural state that I grew up in Taiwan. feel quite like home. And all these sort of nice things, yet I also encounter with uh, people from Taiwan, the immigrant to America. They all told me this horror story about how they've been prejudiced, uh, uh, treated against and all that. And I started to think, all the people I know, most of them are very nice, and why do people have this kind of saying? So I start to pay attention, and I noticed that people don't listen. They only listen to what they want. But if you listen with your heart, then you know. So from very early on, I know you always to give from heart. When you do that, a joy of river will come towards you. The same thing. Whatever you do, always start from your heart. And so I guess I'm very fortunate that I, I sort of see that and I feel for that and 
and I always speak up what I believe. So when I actually um, was ready to do some more serious study, I chose uh, preventive medicine. And that field has a lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of uh, experiment um, that we're trying to save the world because I, I also like to help too. But when I learned that the human genome had to be uh, manipulated to do things in order to save some people's life or to make our um, uh, sufferance sort of uh, less, but it's based on other costs that is not necessary what I believe. I start to think this is, may not be what I want to do for the rest of my life. Infected the, the, the rats or the mice, and then you try to see how it would help human. I know in my heart there's a better way to help without doing that. So I believe it was in 1990, the end of 1990, in early 1991, my husband invited me for a backpack trip to Mexico, and that changed my life. We took one month to travel, and that is something I haven't done for some time, and I loved it. And it must be, it must meant to be for me to meet two immunologists from England. As we were touring around, and we had a, we had a lovely chat, and as I learned and found out they were the very important figures in the immunology field. They are the professional, and they guided me. That is a field that rely on funding, otherwise some research may not continue. And so the message hit home to me. That is, I would like to spend my life in doing things that I know, that it can bring us to somewhere, and not depending on something. I want autonomy, I also want the effectiveness. So when I got back, I thought to my professor, I would no longer come to the lab and kill all the mice and do all that. i like to do something different, something they would not require doing that. I would not believe in manipulating with all these, these genomes and trying to make people live 430 or um, things like that in their nature. And it just happened, I was pregnant. And I become a mom. And if you ask me to be the mother or to be the doctor, which one is more important? I chose to be the mother. And I think that it's a beautiful mistake, but it's a beautiful one, a sweet burden. So I chose to be the mother and raise my daughter. And every day I told a story to her, ever since she was very young. So. At one year old, two year old, she already can read. Remember everything I said to her. Then I discovered the potential of human race, that you gotta start young. Imagine that. If my mom read to me when I was one year old, maybe I'll be very different today, but maybe not. But anyway, I continue to uh, read story to her until she uh, sort of like, could read herself and she no longer need, but we still tell stories every single day. When she was five years old, she asked me, could, that time we already relocated back to Taiwan, she asked me if I could go to her classroom to share a story with her classmates. I said, of course I could, but tell me why. And she said, because I, I told a story that you shared with me last night but they don't believe that was true unless you come. So would you come? And I said to her, of course I'll come. So I went to the class and then uh, I asked everyone to sit in a circle. So everyone was in a circle, we can see everybody. And I told the story again to the whole class. I discovered their eyes shine with incredible lights. At that time, a message hit home to me that I must choose very carefully the material that I share with children because they trust it in me. Whenever I say, as long as it's that you sincerely give in, they will uptake everything. 
So of course, for better tomorrow, and as a parent, we know the whole world. We are just like the big family. So for me, it is a very good opportunity to be able to do. So I then was asked to go to the class every single day. I did. So every day I have story books in my backpack and I start to tell story from the book and I translate from English to Chinese because at that time, Taiwan do not have very many picture book in Chinese yet. Then I start to participate in library and I learned the library open hour was not friendly. So I speak up, I talk to the bureaucrat, I demand the director of the culture affair, the culture division, they need to change the hour for children and parents and that. So I become a very free uh, soul because I, I, don't, I don't have to worry about you don't pay me salary because I'm a volunteer. And so that started the, my ways of, uh, um, how, do call, how do you call that? Uh, another ways of growing in Taiwan. That is, I learned the community. People do not really know much about storytelling or that. But because I have some books that I, I realized that story was so uh, incredible. It inspired and changed some of the kids' ways of thinking. I see in their ways of behaving. So I talked to the parents. So I started to organize study group. I started to start to organize things. I want people to come together and read the same book. And we discussed, and then we become a better citizen. Then we can care better for the community. That's all it started in 1998. Somebody called me. Would you like to be part of our study group? I said, of course. So then that's what happened. So ever since 1998, I started a study group uh, on campus where my husband teaches, uh, taught at that time. And then as my daughter gets a little bit older, every year I go to her, every week I go to her class and tell stories. And then pretty soon I realized that um, I've been asked by children, could you come to my class too? So I go to one and two and then three and other school I ask two. So I realized that there's a demand. So I thought I never write any proposal. I thought oh, it would be nice if I, if I could ask some help maybe. So I wrote down why I want to do this and, and what do I need. It's a very simple A4 size uh, word proposal. Then I give it to the study group friends. I said, would you like to join me? If we invited somebody who is an author or somebody who knows how to tell a story, then we all learn and we can all help everyone. They say, yeah. I said, if you find five people and you two, and you two, and then each one of us only 500 NT, that's very doable. I said, no problem. Then I said, by the way, do you have extra copy of your proposal? I said, yeah. So I give them and guess what? The fundraising went too good, too smoothly. I only won $5,000 was about uh, three, uh, 300 uh, US dollars. No, 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 not 300, what is it for now? Less than $200. But end up I have 160,000 dollars. That's about 5,000 some dollars. Way beyond um, what I ask. So instead of doing one, I do more. And then that particular year, I trained the most number of volunteers in Taiwan history, 120 storytellers at the same place and supported by the government funding. I never thought the government would fund us, but they did because the fundraising brought more people and they realized they needed to do that too. So it just happened to be the right time. I'm doing the right thing, and perhaps I'm the right person to start. Then when I share a story to children, I always ask the audience if you uh, could tell me how you connected with the story that you heard. Is there something that you remember? Tell me. So the first time they will tell me what they think and how they connected with the story that I share. And second time I ask them to write down, and if they don't know how to write, I'll help them. 
So they start with listening, then they speaking, then they write. After they write, then I invited them to come one by one to the front, and they share with everybody what they wrote. And that's uh, when I finish everybody's story being heard. Then I say, okay, now you do a little illustration for your little story. And everybody was so happy to do. If they don't know how to draw, I'll say, okay, you don't know how to do a rabbit. You know, rabbit have long ear, like that, and two eyes, right? And what else they have? So I guided them to imagine something they don't know with this verbal guiding. And they already got that picture, finished, happy. So every day, I will generate more than 20 copies of the stories done by these little children, all nice ones. And I wanted to have a place that I can show them. So I take them in my bag and I show and I share wherever I go. But then I decided I should really ask the government. Maybe they have many, many old buildings they are not using for any purpose. Then they can use for the, the, this exhibition and story sharing. So I pick up my phone and I call. And that started my story house, 2005. Then 2006 was the year that I brought the community volunteers and their children into the house before they become officially open. I thought, simply, if you just get together, you read to them, you don't need anything else. Story House started something like almost no funding. But then, because we were going to do something more for the community, so I talked to the magistrate. I pretty much persuaded her that storytelling is essential for the nation. The storytelling is a very important nutrient for anyone for growth and education. And I'm lucky too, she heard me. And then with the help of the director, all three of us together, we, we also asked for funding uh, donation from the private sector. So in 2007, we got a very tiny amount of money to start the story house. And then it started to get a little bit bigger each year. And it's hard to imagine this year is the 10th year. And when I had a story house, I asked people to come, to share, and to write. So I started to design courses for people to come and do the same thing as the kid do. I tell them a story, then they write in return. And as I show on the presentation, sometimes each person only needs one, one page, but I really wanted to have the community people to write a story about their own. So ever since 2008, I started to do a very regular courses for the community people to write story. And that year we started to print the community picture book. So we have our own books started. This year is the ninth year. We have more than 100 books now printed. And each year the story become um, more diversified, the age group become younger. And because I realized that once you print a book, the story been shared one time is not enough. We really need to go out, and so I suggest that we should just, I think the easiest way I do it by myself is bicycle. So I did. I asked my illustrator story uh, book uh, illustrator, uh, Jeff, my friend, who is the artist in resident for the story house, if he would be interested to go with me. So he would document by painting when I, when I tell stories. and. We got everything ready. We got a bicycle, was donated by people who heard out my dream. The box was also donated done by a volunteer in a community. And then I have the story, and we make the car, and uh, I got some candy in the box, and off we went. And we bike one village to the next. So if there's 10 books printed, it would take me 10 days, because each community I wanted to go in to that little um, uh, tribal area or the little township, it takes a whole, whole day. In the morning, go to the school. In the afternoon, we study and we learn. 
the tour guide from the local people. And at night, we would eat with the local people and sleep with them. The next day, I bike to the next town. And I did, this is my eighth year. So in between, I also bike around Taiwan, and then now I bike around, Thai, around the world. And so things never stop, it just keep growing. But I think I have to mention that all this, in the process of, of me become a storyteller, I have many, many teachers. Every single one that I encounter has a story that's unique, and I learn from it. I have a specialty. I take yours and theirs and put together and then transform into a something uh, different. So when I encounter Gunter Pali, his story was another new page for me, completely refreshing, and that take a wild turn. And now I'm still continuing the true story that based on the community people, they write their story. At the same time, I tell story around the world about the environment. Because when I was in university uh, in America, I, I took some courses in social studies and, and ecology. I was very much inspired by all the teachers that I encountered in North America. It meant so much to me. And I also have to thank my husband, who is solely, truly supportive to my storytelling. He did not realize how, how crazy I was until that I, don't, I hardly home when my daughter became older. So one day he stopped me in front of the gate. He says, where are you going today? Why are you so busy? Are you trying to be elected as a, a, a representative or politician or what? Why are you, what are you trying to prove? And I says, nothing. I just think this is a good way to give. I believe this is a very meaningful way to, to do things, and this made me happy. He said, okay, as long as it makes you happy, then it's fine. So I have the total support from my family to, to behave the way I behave now. I travel around the world, I, I go wherever people call for it. And storytelling becomes a way of living for me. And so that's my story. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>